Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I am so honored to be here. I always uh, consider it a success to get through these luncheons without getting anything on my tie. <laughs> I think I did okay. I think I did okay. Uh, I would like to um, just say that I am so honored today to be here to put the spotlight on the Institute for Life and Care. I got to visit this organization last week. Nancy gave me the tour, talked about the programs they have, what they do there, and what they do there is nothing short of amazing. As many of you know, I do, the, um, I do the morning show over at Channel 9, and so for four and a half hours a day, we deal with news. Some of it is a lot of fun, but some of it is very tough, too. And we often report on stories about situations that create incredible stress. So much stress, especially for, you know, first responders, the people Nancy was talking about. The, the doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, the police officers, the caregivers, all these people are just, they're wound up in the news every day. We hear about them, but do we really think about them? And not only do we think about them, but do we think about what they must be going through too? So it is at least reassuring to know that their issues are not forgotten. There are people out there who have made it their goal to help the people that help us. We appreciate it very much. I've known Nancy, as she said, for 25 years, always been amazed by your energy, compassion, expertise, commitment to get things done. When you do something, it always comes from the heart, and that is so obvious, and, and just appreciate it very much, Nancy. So I salute the, uh, the entire staff at the Institute for Life and Care for their mission and for what they do for others. And now we're going to get to our guests for the day, and uh, I'm just going to have the three of you come on up and, I guess, take a seat. That's how we'll do this. And I would like to introduce them to you at this time. I got to talk to them over lunch. These are some very interesting people, trust me. So our panelists today on the far end, Victoria Sweet. Victoria is an associate <laughs> clinical professor of medicine and history at the University of California. San Francisco. San She's a prize-winning historian with a PhD in medical history. Her latest book is God's Hotel, I love the name, God's Hotel, a doctor, a hospital, and a pilgrimage to the heart of medicine. Victoria lays out some evidence in the book for some radically new ideas about medicine and health care. I'm sure we're going to hear more about that today. Please say hi to Victoria Sweet. Okay, truly on the left side is Brian Luke Seward. Brian is a renowned and respected expert and author on stress management, great for our discussion today, body, mind, spirit, healing, and health promotion. He's been involved with specials on PBS. He has spoken at many college graduations, conferences, medical seminars all over the world. Brian has also written 14 books. Please welcome Brian Luke Seward. And our final guest today is Wayne Miller. He is a leadership mentor, an author, a speaker, a consultant, and founding president of the Institute of the Southwest. He is a graduate of the Harvard Divinity School and has made it his life's work to help people triumph over, diver uh, over adversity. Please welcome Wayne Miller. So what we're going to start out doing, I think, is I, I have a couple questions to, to get this thing started. And we're going to uh, direct them to each of you and give you roughly five minutes so you can expound a little bit uh, on these uh, first questions. And then we'll get the crowd involved. And, and they'll be asking you questions maybe about their stress, maybe about something they read, something they saw, something they've been going through. And, uh, and it's kind of cool because each one of these people are going to talk about stress, but they're going to do it from different backgrounds. Uh, and so it, it, it's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to it. So the first question, and Victoria, let's start with you. So as a physician's perspective, what impact does persistent stress have on all of us? So do I sit here? You, you can, yeah, can or you can move can around I like if you'd like. Can I stand? I, sure. I, I do better, speaking of stress, moving. 
you know, they got these little, got these little microphones, yeah. so it's, it um, works out great. But if I go down there because I'm short, I'll disappear, so I'll, I'll try and stand up here. So Nancy actually, uh, th this is not completely verbatim, because the other day Nancy uh, and I talked on the phone, and uh, she said that she picked us a little bit because like doctor, so body, mind, and soul, so I'm, I'm body. So, um, and she pretty much asked me to, and I thought it was really great to talk about and remind us of what are the effects of stress on the body from a medical point of view. I mean, we all know a fair amount, but I'm gonna review it for you. And I reviewed it for myself, which is pretty interesting to go back and look at what we know about stress on the body. So stress was actually something that wasn't really thought of till around the 20th century, mid 20th century. And there was a guy, as you remember, probably named Hans Selye, who came up with the idea of stress. And he thought of the idea of stress because he'd noticed as he was working on the physiology of the body that um, the body had a general adaptive reaction to almost any stress he was experimenting with. So for instance, if he would do a really loud noise at an animal, it would have a certain series of stress. If he would uh, do bright lights at an animal, it would have a certain group of stress uh, reactions. And if he would put the animal in a frustrating, untenable situation that the animal could not get out of, the animal would have this series of bodily reactions. So he came up with this general adapted syndrome in the 30s. And um, it's what we know today as the acute stress reaction. Um, and he researched it and, he, and looking, uh, reviewing things from what I learned in medical school many years ago, we haven't learned uh, much different. He did a good job in the 30s of describing what the acute stress reaction is. So it turns out acute stress is actually not really bad for you. So what happens when you get an acute stress? A life-threatening situation, usually. So what happens is two things in the body. There's two systems. <clears throat> First of all, there's the cortisol system. So your um, hypothalamus releases something called corticotropin releasing factor, which then goes to your pituitary that tells us to produce the ACTH, right? Which then goes to your uh, adrenals, which are over the renal system, right? Your adrenals that produce adrenaline, epinephrine from a medical point of view, and norepinephrine. And that, so cortisol comes out of your kidneys, your adrenal glands, and also adrenaline. In addition, in your brain, so there's two separate systems actually. There's this cortisol system, and then there's the adrenaline system. And the cortisol system has one group of effects in acute stress reaction, and the uh, adrenaline system has another. But this stress also affects the brain directly, and the brain cells in the locus ceruleus produce uh, norepinephrine, which is a form of adrenaline as well. So what does that do in an acute stress situation to the body? Well, the cortisol, uh, enters into all the cells of your body and turns on and off a series of genes. It also um, increases your sugar level in your body, your glucose level in your body. It causes fluid to, to transpire into your system, so your blood pressure increases in that sense. But of course, adrenaline and its, and its sister noradrenaline, norepinephrine in the brain, has a different set. What does it do? It causes your uh, blood vessels to contract, so your blood pressure goes up in an acute stress situation, your pulse goes up, your heart beats stronger, and your coagulation system clots more quickly. You with me so far here? So that's acute stress. And what Selye noticed, and he was accurate, was that, that stress, once he removed the acute stress from the animals, this is true in general, that, that acute stress, all that stuff goes away in 20 to 30 minutes. All those chemicals are gone. So acute stress is actually a smart thing that the body does. And then Walter Cannon at Harvard, also in the 30s, uh, kind of put it all together and talked about what was this good for? It was good for fighting, right? S alert, stress, focus, blood pressure, heart, all that stuff. And it was good if you were the kind of animal that needed to run away from the stress. Acute stress, not really bad for you. Chronic stress, which is what we're talking about here, is completely different because when the body does not have a chance to ever relax from that, this thing continues to happen. So the blood pressure does not get high and then go down. It stays high. So people under chronic stress get hypertension. 
because the blood pressure's up all the time and the heart's stimulated all the time and the pulse is fast and that never goes away, you get heart attacks and heart failure. Because the coagulation system never has a chance to settle down and the blood's clotting very, very sensitively, uh, clots quickly, you get increased strokes. And because you get increased strokes, you get an increased chance of what we call multi-infarct dementia. And you get increased, the sense of increased mm, uh, chronic anxiety, let's call it. The sense you can never relax because you can't ever relax because the stress is continuing to produce adrenaline and noradrenaline in your body and you're just revved up all the time. Naturally, being human beings, we also have a mind. And so we think about ways in which we could just finally relax. Alcohol, sex, food, sleep, all the things we call addictions are in some way a very understandable attempt to get out from under this chronic um, excretion, really, of chemicals that cause all these things to happen. And the last thing that Hesselian noticed, which was really something I thought very interesting, is that even though acute stress typically only lasts for 20 minutes and go away, what he noticed is that animals that he subjected to acute stress, no stress, acute stress, no stress, they never really recovered completely 100% from that acute stress moment. They had lost a little bit. They aged a little bit. And we now know, the one thing that was different from even when I was in medical school, we know what happens. Every time you're under acute stress, the telomeres, have people heard of telomeres? They're the ends of your chromosomes, and you start out with long telomeres, and they protect the chromosomes from genetic damage, but you only have a certain length that you're kind of born with. And every time you're under an acute stress, the telomere decreases. So that the last thing that chronic stress does is basically um, cause um, uh, faster aging. So those are the, uh, from a body point of view, those are what happens with chronic stress. You get increased strokes, heart disease, dementia, anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue, because your body also just wears out and your adrenal gland actually get chronic adrenal fatigue as well as increased aging. So I'm going to stop there. I think that's about five minutes. And I will pass it on to the, to the uh, brain part of the um. <laughs> OK. <laughs> At, when you put it that way, it sounds even worse than I thought, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so Luke, uh, uh, from a psychological standpoint, I guess, talk a little bit about what you think stress can do to us. Do you know how to talk about this in five minutes? I'm going to get stressed. Yeah. <laughs> I do believe that, but I'll stop you. It's OK. I'm a college <laughs> professor, and um, I teach stress management for both undergraduate and graduate students. And um, I can't get it all in in 16 weeks. So here goes at warp speed. First of all, let's give a couple different definitions of stress. Stress is such a colossal topic that um, it is really hard to pinpoint. And the reason why is because every discipline in academia seems to say it's their own. In the field of sociology, psychology, theology, physiology, everyone says this is what stress is. So just to kind of give you a categorical perspective, because as a health psychologist, I look at the integration, balance, and harmony of mind, body, spirit, emotions. I look at the big picture. So a couple different definitions. Hans Selye said that stress is wear and tear in the body. And all you have to do is think about attention, headache, and think, yep, that makes sense. Um, Richard Lazarus, very famous psycho psychologist, said that stress is the inability to cope with problems. That makes sense. Um, if you've ever had road rage or seen someone's road rage, this one might make sense. From an emotional perspective, we could say that stress is the loss of emotional control. Yep, that makes sense. And from a spiritual perspective, forgive me here, um, I like this definition. I learned it from Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Stress is the absence of inner peace. Well, if you were to get a bunch of people together in a room like this who all claim to be experts in stress, you might hear them say this as a consensus of what a definition is. And again, I don't think we have one, but let's go with this to start with. Stress is a perceived threat. We have the word perceived in quotes because you can have two people in the same situation. One person saying, God, isn't this great? And the other person saying, I'm freaking out. So we say stress is a perceived threat. And then we say in parentheses, real or imagined, because we can all make mountains out of molehills. I love the quote from Mark Twain who says, I'm an old man now, and I've known a great many problems in my life, most of which never happened. 
So stress is a perceived threat, real or imagined, to our mind, body, spirit, or emotions. The fight or flight response, as so eloquently uh, described here, actually goes back to our days of cave people when we were trying to outlive uh, saber-toothed tigers, the things who saw us as human hamburgers. Um, today, our stressors are not so much physical as they are more mental, emotional, or spiritual. And um, I like to quote Terry Gross. I listen to NPR quite a bit. And, um, I listened to her show Fresh Air, and she said very poetically about four or five months ago to one of her guests, she said, we live in a culture of distractions. And that is so very true now, because although we probably have always had that, the rate at which things are coming at us to feel overwhelmed, the sensory bombardment, and the number coming at us is such a magnitude we've never seen before. Now, in the Eastern culture, they call people who are distracted, they have a case of monkey mind. Your mind is racing all over the place. Uh, ricochet thoughts here and there. We don't have monkeys in North America, so I call it squirrel mind. But you get the idea. And in terms of the biggest problems I see today, and we, how much time do we have, um, I see a huge problem with technology. Technology is great. It is something that's supposed to serve us. But I've seen over the course of the past couple of years, people have given their power away to digital screens. We now actually have a new uh, classification of, uh, of um, psychological problems called screen addictions, where people basically cannot live without their technology, to the point that they begin to get anxious if they misplace it, if the battery dies, or God forbid, two of them go off at once, they don't know which to answer first. Um, so I call this, and I'm not alone to call this, is digital toxicity. And this is just one more layer of stress we have now in terms of our, our culture uh, of being bombarded. And wherever you have stress that goes longer than this acute thing, which is, is um, acute stress is about 20 minutes. You can't go much longer than that, you'll implode. But you'll, you know when you've had acute stress because your heart's about to pound out of your chest and if you ever had a traffic ticket, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the issue I see right now is, is um, I just lost my train of thought here. <laughs> the, um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> exactly. So Sorry, is my five minutes up? <laughs> no, I got, I got three more. Bottom um, digital toxicity is, is truly a problem. And um, ultimately, and this is, I got quoted on PBS because um, uh, Deepak Chopra is a colleague of mine and he liked this expression I had and he called me up one day and said, can I, I'm gonna go on PBS tonight, can I use this? And I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. The body becomes the battlefield for the war games of the mind. Wherever you've got prolonged stress, you've got an ego control drama. And you don't often hear people talking about the ego when they talk about stress, but believe me, it is there. It is the shadow we heard about earlier. And where stress goes beyond the acute stage into chronic, we have some level of a control drama where the person has given their power away. And so in terms of this, ultimately the body is a casualty of this because, again, I'll say the body becomes a battlefield for the war games of the mind. We'll save the rest for later. My time is up. <laughs> Thank you. You know how I know that? I have this digital device <laughs> that I'm keeping track of you guys. Um, gosh, I'd like to take his class, don't you think? I mean, it's good stuff. Uh, Wayne, so from a spiritual, uh, from a religious, from a, a, you're a counselor, from that perspective, talk about stress and, and what it does to us. Hmm. Well, I, th I think I'm going to uh, follow Victoria's lead and um, uh, stand up and move around a little because it is definitely easier to relax moving a little bit. Um, all right, so let's just do a little experiment to give us uh, a visceral um, collective uh, baseline, if you will, about stress. So um, see if you can follow along. I'd like you to um, uh, visualize now um, an image of, um, uh, of, of the, the front range. Then I'd like you to imagine um, uh, an image of the Empire State Building. And then I'd like you to imagine uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and then um, uh, a Volkswagen, and then um, an elephant, and then uh, an elephant driving a Volkswagen across the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> um, is everybody okay? Keeping up? We're doing all right? You know? All right, let's try part two of the experiment. So now I want you to be um, really excited. And now I'd like you to be um, 
really frustrated. Um, now I'd like you to be uh, furiously angry. Um, now I'd like you to be ecstatically happy. Um, now I would like you to be in heart-shredding grief. Um, anybody need a little extra time? Um, <laughs> So what? So what's going on? I mean, you know, you guys were keeping up really well, and then you sort of like, you know, went right in the crapper there. I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, well, one of the things that's going on is, of course, the mind can process information and imagery at an extraordinary rate of speed, and many of our technologies in our lives we have constructed with and married our lives to the speed of the technologies which mirror the speed of our mind's capacity. In the olden days, when you used to have to call up the internet, you know, and, you know, have the internet answer and make the, yeah, you know, and, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, the web page would sort of like, you know, and then it was the wrong one. You have to call back the internet and explain that wasn't, you know. Well, now we have like broadband, like eight gigabytes, you know, every millisecond, you know, and in like two seconds you can get a web page, and people are still pissed. Two seconds. <laughs> Who's got two seconds? Come on, get, where are the IT people? I got two. I, I can't wait two seconds, because <laughs> the mind can go so quickly. But the problem is the heart, and what the heart knows, and how the heart knows what it knows takes time. To love someone, to be intimate with someone takes time. To be with children and raise them well takes time. Friendship takes time. Trust takes time. Healing, wisdom, they all take time. We have our mind moving at one speed and our heart rushing to catch up to the mind, and it will never happen. So to a certain degree, we are caught in the pincers of two very natural human processes. But the more we marry our sense of accomplishment to the technologies that mirror the mind, the more our heart gets left behind. And it also means that the things that do take time, like being with one's family, or if one is called to be a physician, to have sufficient time to be with a patient, to really hear the story inside the story, to know how best when you place your hand on the wound, to know it will land where it belongs. Those things take time and robbed of that, people feel sad. And we feel when we can't be the parents, we wish to be the friends, we wish to be the healers, the teachers, the clergy, the social workers. There's a tremendous amount of grief that we all carry because we can't bring the best of what we know is possible and that we've experienced. And when it does happen, it's so extraordinarily magical and beautiful and nourishing that we ache for it and we grieve the missing of it. And my, in my experience, if people don't have the time to grieve, what they will often do is speed up. It's sort of like when you're a kid and you get a rock and you toss it, and you try to get it to skip across and not get wet, you know, but if it slows down, then it sort of sinks all the way to the bottom. Well, when, when we're in grief, what happens is if we can go fast enough, we won't let ourselves feel how much we've lost. So to a certain degree, part of the impact of the speed, the technology, the mind, is ultimately, in a way, pulling the camera back as if America were the saddest country in the world. Because we've lost so much as a country, as a people, as a culture, and it comes out in speed and loss of things that are precious, and that is a recipe for what we call stress. Well said.
So even in journalism school, I was taught you, you never talk to somebody, you never interview somebody about a problem without asking them about a solution, right? And so that obviously is the next question. And we'll just go back to Victoria. If you could talk about individual stress on people's lives that you have all described and what are some of the things we can do about it? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I should say that uh, Nancy and I also talked about this and we talked for a while and she said, just be yourself. So I said, are you sure? <laughs> and she said, yeah. So um, I'm gonna tell you what I do to deal with stress. They're my own little tricks. Um, so the first thing I do with stress is to start trying to re realize that I'm stressed. Because for years, for instance, every time I'd walk into the hospital, I didn't realize until after I stopped walking to the hospital how stressed it made me. Just to go, wow, I'm stressed. How do I know I'm stressed? Because I'm angry, I'm frustrated, my heart's pounding, my head aches. To realize that I'm stressed and then to recognize what's stressing me. And my first uh, technique is then, when I recognize that, is to avoid those occasions. Uh, to avoiding stress is the best way. So for, I'll give you an example. S out of town speaking engagements stress me out. <laughs> they do, but I love them too because they're really fun, right? So I, last year when I realized, wow, you know, these really stress me out, I decided I would take one a month. And no more than one a month. And I won't take three a month, period. So avoiding, knowing that you're stressed, and then trying to just avoid it, it's the best thing. The next thing, my, uh, so well, sort of related, it's minimizing stress. And uh, I came up with this, because it, it's amazing how much stress we put on ourselves we don't need. Um, and uh, you know, I think so, so America may be um, a, a very unhappy country, but it's also a perfectionist country, I think. Most people I know are perfectionists. We got to do the thank you notes and have the drawers and have the perfect grass and, and remember, and when we don't do all those things, we feel bad. So I came up with this concept of the 80% solution, that I would always and only do 80%. I would never wait until I'd done the 100% before I relaxed or did what I want to do. I'd just be happy with 80% of the dishes, 80% of the emails. No, it's not that easy, actually. You really <coughs> have, to, you have to accept that you're going to leave a whole bunch of stuff undone. I forgot to pick up the cleaners. Oh well, you know, I forgot this and that to bring here. I mean, I'm, I know, no matter how often I travel, I'm gonna forget 20% of the stuff. I just am, right? I just try not to forget the important stuff. So that 80%, and then I came up with a third concept um, to ask myself, and I freely give it, this to you. When I had to do something that I knew was gonna stress my, and I could feel in myself I really didn't wanna do it, I asked myself, do I wanna do it? Do I have to do it? And if I didn't want to do it, I didn't have to do it, I don't do it. And I call this, I don't want to. I don't have to. And I ain't gonna. <laughs> it, 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 and I give it to you, it's a, it's a mantra. So what do I do? So, so what do I do when I ha I'm in a situation where, you know, I'm just in it. I'm being a dog, the emails, everything's horrible. Blah, blah. And I can feel that, that I'm really getting stressed. So I have a couple of tricks. So um, I believe in taking mini vacations during the day. And I told Nancy I actually think of this as smoking. <laughs> we used to take, mini vacations used to be built in our day. Every hour, people took two, three, four minutes, they went outside, they chewed, and it was not only, expe it was expected, it was, it, everybody did it, and you hung out with people and you smoked. And it's one of the things that if I were the, the, the tobacco companies, I would go back and look at my data because I have a feeling there's things that smoking did for us that were good. Um, <laughs> so I, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, if I, I'm sure I'm offending a whole bunch of people. And I'm not telling you to smoke, I really am not. Lung cancer's terrible and COPD's horrible. But taking a mini vacation, what I call metaphorical smoking, um, do I have like 10, how many? You got a minute and a half. Okay.